Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, a keynote presentation, Next Generation RNA-Seq Workflows and Analysis. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. I am Judy O'Rourke, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button lower left. I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Gary Schroth, PhD. Dr. Schroth is currently a distinguished scientist at Illumina, where he directs the Genomic Applications Group based in San Diego. He obtained his PhD in biochemistry from the University of California at Davis and has been working in the field of next generation sequencing, NGS, for 10 years as part of Illumina and Solexa. In his research, Dr. Schroth uses NGS to study gene structure, expression, and regulation, and applies this to genomic projects in the fields of cancer, microbiology, and infectious disease. Over the course of his career, Dr. Schroth has published 90 peer-reviewed research papers and holds 17 U.S. patents. I will now turn it over to Dr. Schroth for his presentation. Thank you, Judy. Um, it's a pleasure it's a pleasure to be here and to uh, uh, talk to this audience about um, what I'm going to call next generation RNA-seq. So as Judy mentioned, I've been working in this field for about 10 years and um, I'm going to talk about sort of some of the, the challenges and complexity of RNA-seq, but at the end of the day, I hope to convince you that actually next generation RNA-seq can be very straightforward and very sort of standardized. And so that's what the, that's what sort of the, the take home message from this uh, talk will hopefully be. Before I get into uh, some of the technical details about doing RNA-seq, I want to just remind people that the transcriptome um, inside the cell is, is very complex. We've learned so much about RNA function over the last um, uh, 10, 15, 20, 30 years even, and we know now that there are so many different complex uh, functions that RNA have in the cell, and then we also know that uh, RNA transcription can be very dynamic. It can go up and down. Uh, quite a lot. It can vary uh, in tissue to tissue quite a lot. And so um, there's a lot of complexity and RNA-seq is, is, has turned out to be sort of the most uh, specific and unbiased and uh, sensitive tool for kind of understanding all of the complexity of the mammalian uh, or eukaryotic transcriptome. Um, and so if you look in eukaryotic cells, there are many different RNA subpopulation. There's, um, on the left, I show sort of the coding RNAs, messenger RNA, and some of those can vary in expression from e even enormously expressed uh, transcripts, more than 10,000 copies per cell. And then the sort of explosion in the RNA world in the last 15, 20 years has been in the non-coding RNAs. Of course, we've known about ribosomal RNA and tRNA for a long time, but the whole field of link RNAs and small RNAs is something that is um, that has really exploded in in the last decade, and so I think that um, that makes that makes the uh, the, the interest in, in doing RNA seq um, even greater for some of these uh, different interesting classes. Now, from a from a technical point of view, um, you can say that most of the RNAs over on the left, the messenger RNAs, um, are polyadenylated, although not all. There's some very um, abundant genes, like histone genes, for instance, that are not polyadenylated. And then, and then on the right, you can say that many of these are not polyadenylated. It gets kind of complicated because it turns out many link RNAs, for instance, are polyadenylated. Um, most of the, the RNAs shown there in red are not. No microRNAs are polyadenylated. But some of the link RNAs, um, some of the more famous link RNAs, in fact, are polyadenylated. And this is important because we, as, as I'll talk about, when we do RNA-seq preps, we tend to think of uh, different flavors of the preps, some that use a poly A capture and some that don't. And so when you do that, you've got to keep in mind that you're sort of parsing up the, um, uh, the RNAs that are in the cell in, in that way. And so the other interesting thing about studying RNA compared to uh, DNA is that RNA comes in all kinds of different sizes and shapes, and, and it has a, a different, definitely a different stability profile than, than DNA. 
Um, and probably one of the most interesting and, and, and probably challenging from a technical point of view is the enormous copy number variation that, that RNA has compared to DNA. And so if you look at that, the transcriptome inside any cell is, is, um, has an enormous trans, uh, dynamic range, especially when you look at a population of cells. Um, you know, when we look at large amounts of RNA, say 100 nanograms, that represents thousands of cells. And so you basically are detecting, um, you know, generally about 15,000 transcripts across a large dynamic range that is 10 to the fourth, maybe 10 to the fifth uh, dynamic range of, of counts that you get from those. And that's what this is here. This is a reproducibility plot of two preps, two RNA-seq uh, preps done on the same sample and then run on two different uh, say lanes of a sequencer and then comparing the counts, the actual counts. And so that's why you can see the digitization of the data down here at the bottom. And, and there's been a lot of debate over the years as to how much data do you need for RNA-seq? Um, you know, what do you need 10 million reads or 50 million reads or 500 million reads to do a good RNA-seq experiment? And basically, just to sort of point out that, that the genes at the top end of this sort of rocket ship plot are very easy to study. Uh, those have deep coverage even with a few million reads. Um, all the debate is generally about the genes down at the lower end of this expression level. These are more challenging to study from a counting point of view because every time you collect um, another 10 million reads, probably eight or nine million of them go to the genes that are at the top of the pile that are already very, very well studied. And so this is, uh, this is where the dynamic range of, a, of the transcriptome has, um, uh, makes RNA-seq a little bit more challenging to study some of the things down at the low end. Um, and so I, I think that that's, that's a consideration. And over the years, we have developed a pretty good understanding of this for our different preps, and we have very clear recommendations uh, to users as to what, what, how, much are, how, much, how many reads would be recommended for these uh, sort of optimal kind of return on investment of reads versus uh, uh, what you're getting, information content you're getting out of that. And then just to remind you that, of course, in, um, <clears throat> in eukaryotic systems, the gene can be spread out on a chromosome uh, in, in relatively large regions of the chromosome so that uh, a, an initial primary transcript is made that is then spliced into potentially alternatively spliced mature messenger RNAs. And so that's the other interesting thing we've learned with our RNA-seq over the years is that, you know, depending upon what type of prep you use, if you use a, a, a poly A selection sort of prep, captures only the, the messages there at the bottom. But if you do something that we call total RNA-seq, and I'll talk about the details of that in a second, you've got to remember that you're capturing everything. You're capturing all the primary transcripts, all the introns that have been spliced out, plus all the messenger RNA. And so um, I, I love this slide that uh, Brent Gravely from the Mod Encode project let me borrow. Um, this, is, this is just to give a, you a feel for the dynamics of, that goes on in a typical transcriptome. And so um, this is kind of a microcosm of that kind of a, a, a statement. If you, if you look at um, uh, this, what this shows is um, brow browser shots of the data aligned from, this is from a Drosophila experiment. And this is just um, one small region of one chromosome in Drosophila. And then the time points, the different tracks are, are, are time points of Drosophila embryo development. And so you can just see the data is, is, what, is what is cool about this is the data is showing the, sort of the strandedness um, where the data is either above the line or below the line, depending upon whether it maps to the Watson or the Crick strand, um, which is, of course is a really nice feature of, of RNA-seq. Um, you get very explicit details about the um, the, the strand that the, that the uh, transcript is coming from. But what I wanted you to see is that you can see, if you, if you look at these genes, how they changed even during the first 24 hours of Drosophila development, the gene expression patterns are changing quite a lot. And that is, uh, that you can just sort of picture that happening all around our chromosomes at all times in response to, you know, circadian rhythms or what we've eaten or different tissues, whatever. This is, this is why RNA-seq is so exciting is that, that basically there's so much uh, information content that you can get out um, and, and hope to kind of understand these dynamic changes. So um, as I've sort of alluded to, if you, if you look at RNA prep, RNA library prep, there's basically uh, 
two, and now I'm going to introduce a third, a third one today. Uh, there's essentially two major preps that uh, if you look at all of our kits or um, even other kits that are sold out in the marketplace today, they basically can boil them down to two sort of overall protocols. They either capture the messenger RNA, as shown on the left here, where you use usually a, a, a bead with a poly-T primer, capture the messenger RNA, or they do a method where they um, essentially capture the ribosomal RNA and remove that right off the bat. So um, I forgot to mention back in the previous slide, but if you just opened up a eukaryotic cell and just took a physical inventory of all the RNA in there, probably 95% of the molecules that are RNA molecules in the cell, maybe 90 to 95%, are going to be ribosomal RNA. And so um, we like to remove that as much as possible. Poly-A capture is a very effective way of removing the ribosomal. Um, essentially, you can think of it as enriching for the mRNA. But um, there's also methods where you can use essentially probes on beads to remove the ribosomal RNA as well, and then essentially sequence everything else. And that we call total RNA seq. And so the uh, uh, the advantages of of that are um, are that, like I said, we can get the specifically get the messenger RNA there on the left, or we can get the total RNA on the right. Um, we have introduced a new, essentially, workflow in the last couple of years that we call RNA access. Essentially, this is using hybrid capture or enrichment sort of methods, um, like we use in exome sequencing or another sort of targeted sequencing, to pull out specific genes or specific regions in the transcriptome that we're interested in sequencing. <clears throat> and so, in this method, the way we do it, we, we don't do a poly-A capture or a ribosomal reduction. We take all of the total RNA, make a library out of it, add adapters, and then we just capture the parts of the library that we're most interested in. And we've successfully used this to, to sequence the entire exome. That's the RNA access product that we sell right now. But we also have, have been working on this in sort of more defined sets, cancer gene sets, fusion sets. We've even studied viral RNAs with this kind of approach. And this is a, this has turned out to be very interesting. I'm not going to get a chance to talk about all those different uh, variations of that, but essentially it has added a third workflow. So our three main workflows in in any RNA prep is going to be uh, um, either capture mRNA, remove ribosomal, or essentially uh, capture specific regions that you're interested in. Uh, just to highlight that actually these these do require different input amounts. All of our standard kits uh, are will work really well down to 100 nanograms. The uh, RNA access kit works down to 10 nanograms, which is um, which is interesting. That's actually a little bit lower input, and that's because we don't remove the ribosomal RNA, and it's sort of in there as a as a essentially kind of a bulking agent there in that middle workflow. <laughs> okay, this is just a to remind me to tell you that we, we actually have a, a, a wide suite of um, RNA library prep solutions. Most of these I'm not going to talk about today. Um, I'm going to focus in on the TrueSeq stranded mRNA and especially a, a new incarnation of that. Um, and, um, and also just to, just to point out that that is by far the most common workflow that is used is, is, is when people think of RNA-seq, they generally think of what we're calling here TrueSeq stranded mRNA, which is capturing the poly A tail and sequencing the coding messages. Um, and also, as Judy alluded to, I've been working in this field for eight or ten years now, and, and we've been doing what we call RNA seq for eight years, and it has evolved a lot over the years. We have, you know, as I alluded to, these stranded and non stranded methods. Um, we have uh, new methods that the total RNA kit methods that I've talked about. Um, we, we, we push these to lower and lower input levels, um, and like I said, all of our standard kits require 100 nanograms, um, uh, only 100 nanograms of kits. Um, we've developed really good methods for studying FFP. Uh, once again, I'm not going to really be able to get into all of this, but I think that that's the major use case for that RNA access workflow that I talked about a second ago, <clears throat> is for studying uh, highly degraded RNA. Um, RNA sequencing at the single cell level is a, is a widely used method, and um, uh, we were involved in some of that work early on. Um, and then the other thing that is important is all of the kits that I'm talking about here are, are automated. Um, so all of the automation vendors of the world, um, uh, Beckman, TCAN, Hamilton, et cetera, all have, um, <clears throat> many of them have uh, um, automated protocols available for, for using the TrueSeq kits. 
Okay. So with that as an introduction, I want to kind of get to the question is, what do I mean by next generation RNA-seq? And so I've, I've, I've kind of talked about how there's, you know, it's, it's relatively complicated in a way. The transcriptome is complicated. It's dynamic. There's lots of choices of, of, of kits to use, et cetera. Um, but in reality, most, like I said, most users um, uh, do the um, uh, uh, mRNA-seq, the poly-A selected <clears throat> mRNA-seq. And so what I want to talk about is um, what we've been doing at Illumina to make this whole process simpler. So over the last uh, 10 years, we've made simple, uh, sequencing quite simple. Um, we have, our, our sequences are very easy to use. If you kind of look across the entire workflow from starting with a sample to getting an answer, the sequencing part is usually the easiest part. Uh, we, we have load and go reagents, push button sequencing, um, the data easily streams to either a local uh, server or to a cloud-based server like our base base uh, server to do analysis. And so every, the, 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 the sequencing part of the workflow has been made simple. Um, but over the last couple of years, we've been working on a new system to try to make library prep a lot simpler as well. And so I want to I want to tell you about a system that we call NeoPrep that um, really is designed to make library prep simple and easy to do um, and, and allow it to be sort of reproducible in any lab that has one of these instruments that will all be able to do sort of RNA-seq to the same level and the same standard um, using this system. And so I want to talk a little bit more about this system. So it's, uh, it, when you order a, a kit for this, for instance, the mRNA kit that I'm going to talk about, you get everything you need in one kit. You just, um, only thing you have to add is your RNA's, RNA's total RNA sample. So starting with total RNA, you uh, essentially load it into a card, as I'll show you here. It, uh, the kit includes all the buffers and reagents to do the library prep and um, quantification and normalization, which is an interesting feature of this. Um, as I'll describe in a second, the libraries that are created by this system are completely ready to load onto a sequencer. So um, the idea is that you uh, basically use the, 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 the information on the instrument. Um, you place the cartridge into this, uh, this holder here. Uh, you put this card on here that sort of directs you where to pipette. You fill up the cartridge with the reagents and your sample. The whole setup time takes less than 30 minutes, um, usually 15 or 20 minutes after you've done it once or twice. But essentially, you're, you're sort of loading in all the reagents into this um, microfluidic uh, card, if you will. And then uh, essentially what you're going to do is press go. Say I want to do an mRNA prep, uh, start it up, and completely walk away and come back in, in a few, several hours, and you'll have 16 um, mRNA-seq preps. So um, you load the reagents. You can see the, uh, the pipette there loading in the reagents. Um, you essentially um, press go, confirm the run details, start the run. Um, and when the, when the run is complete, you essentially collect the, pre, the, the libraries from a, a sort of a collection portal, load them into a plate, and you're ready to go. And so um, basically, this, this process dramatically simplifies the number of steps involved and the number of consumables needed and um, makes for the, the, the entire process to be more quality controlled. So if you look at this, um, we're, we're taking it from 60 steps, doing it the manual way, down to 10 steps in terms of uh, uh, doing it on the NeoPrep. Um, significantly lower amount of consumables needed um, in terms of doing this prep. And, um, and what we think is going to be really interesting is that it, it sort of streamlines the quality control process. So right now, every lab sort of quality controls their libraries slightly differently. This will sort of standardize that so that all the libraries coming off of the NeoPrep system will have been sort of quality controlled in the same manner. And so uh, we are, um, this, this system is in early access right now. Um, and uh, it'll be um, completely available for commercial release in the next month or so. And the idea here is that, actually, just to be thorough, I wanted to just show you that we also have a DNA prep kit, sort of our standard DNA prep kit as well, that has a lot of interesting features. This sort of tells you the, it takes about seven and a half hours to make the DNA libraries, about 10 and a half hours to make the stranded mRNA libraries. 
Um, each cartridge will make 16 libraries at a time. The input amount recommended for our mRNA kit is only 25 nanograms, and I'm going to I'm going to show you some more information about this. So this is technically lower input than our our standard uh, manual kit. <clears throat> this is some background on the on the DNA prep, um, just to let you know that um, the prep. This is sort of how we judge the the Neo prep system: is that it should work as well and create as high quality data as our manual kits do. In general, we but at lower input amounts, and that's what we're showing here. 75 nanograms input into the NeoPrep looks identical in all ways that we can look at it with uh, 200 nanograms of, of human DNA going into the manual version of this kit. And so, um, when it comes to RNA, um, you can see that this this is a this is an example to look at sort of the reproducibility. And so what we did here is we took our two standard samples, um, universal human reference RNA (UHRR) in human brain, and we put them in every other lane of the, of the cartridge. So let's say all the, out of the 16 uh, uh, wells in the cartridge, all the odds are UHR and all the evens are brain. Um, and then this is looking at the final data when you map it back to the genome and look at counts. And those are all little mini scatter plots there like I was showing originally. And you see that when UHR and UHR are compared, you get a nice tight scatter plot. Um, but when you compare UHR to brain, you get this sort of characteristic um, differential gene expression plot, and so that's 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 just showing that essentially all the the eight UHRs and the eight brains are very reproducible. And so I want to show you some of the the data we've we've been using during development of this process to kind of talk about the robustness of this, and and also um, sort of the justification for our 25 nanogram input amount. So we look at um, library yield, uh, uh, strandedness. Um, CV of coverage, this is sort of how spiky it is, for instance, how even the coverage is across the gene. Um, duplicates and percent ribosomal RNA. And so you can see that um, the, uh, the yellow bar there is highlighted sort of our recommended input amount. So we recommend 25 nanograms of total RNA into this uh, cartridge. But I wanna, what I want to show is that um, Actually, it can. This is showing 10, 5, and 2 nanograms there to the left of the yellow bar, in all these plots. And you can see that actually it's making really nice libraries. Even at 2 nanograms, we're getting enough yield for the system to um, uh, quantify and characterize the library at the end of the process. The duplicates do go up a little bit with um, with 5, and then uh, especially 2 nanograms, indicating that we actually really are sort of um, <clears throat> limiting the number of molecules going into the prep. And so that's probably the going to end up being the floor of this sort of this sort of approach um, in terms of, uh, of of the technology that we the way that it's working today but I just want to show this to convince you that 25 nanograms is by far you know it's it's well above a sort of a floor a, a limit so even if your quant is a little bit off and you throw in 10 or 15 or 20 nanograms it should still work very well and the other uh, uh, thing is we wanted to make sure that the preps that we're doing, uh, just as it, like with the DNA, that the preps are comparable to the manual preps. And so um, this is showing a scatter plot of neoprep data um, at 25 nanograms versus the manual process at 100 nanograms. You can see that the, that the reproducibility of the gene expression counts is, is very good. Um, <clears throat> but I wanted to just make the point that even at 10 nanograms compared to manual and even down to that very lowest amount of two nanograms, actually the libraries that we're getting out of the NeoPrep system are completely valid. They're 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 very nice libraries. As you noted in the previous slide, they will have slightly higher duplicate levels, but actually in in pretty much every other way, they're they're behaving quite well as as good RNA seq libraries. So um, the NeoPrep system is an important part of our of our ecosystem. Uh, part of the concept of next generation RNA seq is that we're trying to simplify this entire process. So, I've spent some time talking about the NeoPrep system, which sort of helps feed the sequencers. Um, hopefully, uh, hopefully you can appreciate that our sequencers are actually fairly simple to use. The NeoPrep is designed to simplify the sample prep process. And we also have uh, been spending a lot of time and energy and effort on um, improving the downstream analysis tools, and especially the cloud-based analysis in base space. And so I want to just have a few slides to, to talk about what we what we have there and how that fits into this complete uh, next generation workflow. Um, 
before I get to that, though, I want to I want to just emphasize that NeoPrep libraries are completely compatible with any of our platforms. So, for instance, you could you could prepare 16 bacterial genomes using the Nano Kit, the DNA Nano Kit, and sequence those on a MySeq to reasonable coverage of all 16 genomes. Um, or if you use NeoPrep to compl to create 16 RNA seq libraries, that's actually a good impedance match, if you will, with our NextSeq platform. So that would give you an average of at least 25 million reads per sample. And I'll show you data uh, using that sort of workflow in a few slides. Or um, if you do human genome sequences and you're using the nano kit, uh, you could do 16 human genome sequences, sequence that on one run of a, of a HiSeq X system and do complete human genomes. Um, so the, the point of this slide is that NeoPrep for various applications can feed, um, it's, it's actually a fairly reasonable match at, at, for different applications for our different sequencers. So um, I want to say a few words about the BaseSpace RNA-seq analysis applications. And so BaseSpace is our cloud-based um, analysis environment. Um, and what we have there is actually several applications for doing RNA-seq that we've created, plus there are other applications there that uh, other parties um, outside of Illumina have created for doing RNA analysis. We have uh, uh, two major workflows. One is shown by the two icons on the right. It's the, essentially the top hat alignment and cufflinks assembly and differential expression analysis. So that can get essentially all a lot of information about the transcriptome. I'll, I'll, I'll show some of the features of each of these workflows in a second. Or the, the application on the left that we call RNA Express is generally good for uh, just straight ahead um, straightforward gene expression profiling. Um, it runs a little bit faster, although as I'll show you in a second, in the cloud, speed is not really th that critical of an issue. Everything runs fairly fast in the cloud. So, um, But uh, these are really quite easy to use. Um, uh, and if you've never actually tried them, um, y y I would encourage you to, to open up a BaseSpace account um, and test these out. We have data sets up there that they're free to use, free to analyze, um, and you can sort of test them out and see how well these apps work and what, what the outputs are. They're, they're uh, amazingly simple to use. Essentially, anyone can do these types of bioinformatics, uh, use these types of bioinformatics tools now with these kind of uh, uh, data analysis solutions. <clears throat> okay. Um, so I want to show a specific example of a scientist in my group who did an experiment using the NeoPrep system, the NextSeq sequencer, and, um, and the BaseSpace apps, where we essentially started with 16 total RNA samples and went all the way to fusion calling. So RNA fusion uh, is, a, is a hot topic in cancer, obviously. <clears throat> and so I want to show an example where in less than three days, it actually technically less than two days, you'll see in the timing here, uh, we went from RNA samples to fusion calling, <clears throat> and, um, and I want to show you how that's possible. So to start off with, as I said, setting up the NeoPrep system takes <clears throat> a maximum of 30 minutes. So um, essentially, if you, you start with a, the total RNA, you load the cartridge, as was shown in the, those previous slides, you press go, and you uh, walk away and do something else with the rest of your day instead of uh, monitoring your sample prep. Um, you can, uh, that takes about 10 and a half hours. And typically, people in my group sort of set that up the, at the end of the day, one day, and they come back the next morning and, and the, the libraries are ready to go. Then um, in, in certainly less than an hour, you can pull those libraries together, load them onto an instrument like our NextSeq system that is quite easy to, uh, to, to set up and run. Um, so there's another hour, let's say, of hands-on time to start the sequencing run. That sequencing run takes uh, 18 hours for a 2 by 75 base pair run, which is what we recommend for RNA-seq. Um, and then once that data is collected, it will be streamed up to the cloud. And then once uh, the run is complete, you'll get an email from our system. It'll say, um, your run is complete. And now you can start your base base analysis. And, and essentially, that takes literally less than five minutes um, to sort of set up a, uh, a, a either top hat cufflinks or a RNA Express um, analysis, and um, uh, like I said, that that takes to do an entire run of NextSeq data. It takes eight and a half hours for the the cloud to analyze those 16 samples, and so um, 
So basically what we're, what we're talking about here is, you know, an hour and a half essentially of, of, of effort, hands-on time, um, and 35 hours of essentially clock time to go from starting RNA to fusion calling. And so um, <clears throat> I want to show some examples where we started with these eight uh, cancer cell lines. We've studied these a lot. We've looked at fusions in them a lot. And so um, they have some nice positive controls in there, if you will. And we did these in replicates on the uh, NeoPrep system. So we did two replicate preps of each of these eight samples to give us 16 preps. Um, <clears throat> The, uh, the other interesting thing about the NeoPrep system is that the, the, the workflow is integrated into base space. So um, hopefully you'll be able to read this on your screen. But if you look very carefully, you can see that uh, uh, our, a scientist in our group, Lisa Watson, started this on, uh, at, at, in the evening on a Monday um, and started the prep, came back. It was done the next morning. And essentially, before she even came to work, she pulled up her base space account looked at the data and she could see that that, that essentially um, all 16 of these preps were good. They all have nice status. They all had um, uh, high outputs. They were all sort of, um, uh, uh, the, the system could tell there was material there. It quantified them and normalized them so that all of the libraries that you pull off of the NeoPrep system can be normalized to 10 nanomolar. And so this is showing how the system has normalized them. And essentially, so before Lisa even came to work on Tuesday, she could tell that her libraries were ready to go and she could start thinking about when she wanted to load them onto the next Seek system. And so sometimes during the, during the day and on Tuesday, she, uh, she loaded them onto the next Seek um, and did the sequencing. And then the next day she could look at the, uh, the data to show like, for instance, here's the indexing QC data that shows that without any uh, intervention at all, just taking the um, the indexes as they come off of the NeoPrep system. You can see it's it's fairly nice and fairly uniform index representation. In general, we get uh, CVs of indexes of about uh, 20 percent, 20 to 25 percent, which is about as good as most labs can do manually, frankly. And so the point is, without without having to do any kind of quantification of the, of the libraries at the end of the day, the system automatically does that. All Lisa did is pool the 16 libraries together in equal volumes and load them onto the next system. And this is sort of the, the index representation she got. And so um, um, this is to remind me that, to tell you that, that, that the two, there are different RNA-seq workflows in our, in our base space environment. What Lisa did here is she ran uh, essentially just the top hat part of the, cuff, of the uh, Top Hat Cufflinks workflow. Those are two separate uh, apps. It does alignment, uh, variant calling, and fusion calling. Um, and that's, that's what she used to analyze this particular data. As you can see, there's some, there's some differences between RNA Express and um, Top Hat Cufflinks. Top Hat Cufflinks being the more involved and um, uh, sort of elaborate uh, workflow. RNA Express is really mainly used for gene counting. So um, she was able to get some differential expression. This is just showing sort of two replicates of THP and HL60. And you get gene counts out of this analysis as well. And she's showing sort of the differential expression and sort of the reproducibility per uh, the MYC gene, for instance, that is differentially expressed between these two samples. And you can see the replicates are, are very nice. The differential expression is very nice. There's tools involved in the RNA Express, as you can see here, where you can filter the data based upon fold change, et cetera, and analyze genes that are that are up or down regulated in your samples. So back to the, the fusion story. So basically, um, Lisa Lisa started the uh, the the just to remind you that the time frame of this. She started the NeoPrep run at uh, seven o'clock on Monday afternoon or evening. Uh, the data was, uh, the, the preps were done. She loaded them on the NXSeq on Tuesday. Um, by the time she came to work on Wednesday, she started up the, um, the app once again on her base base account from her personal computer at home and saw that uh, the run looked good. She started the analysis. And by Wednesday afternoon, then, she was able to create this table. And frankly, it took more time to create this table than it did to uh, actually run the analysis. Um, so, you know, you had to she had to look through the different uh, different uh, results that come out of the top hat alignment and create this table. And so, this basically shows the the fusions that we <coughs> excuse me know are in these uh, samples. We're easily detecting them in this in this essentially three day workflow. 
And this is just showing some of the data. You can also take the data out of the BaseBase app and, and, and insert it into um, uh, uh, like IGV or other genome browsers. And you can look at things like this where this is just showing a, a clear fusion in this A431 cell line that doesn't exist in the MCF7 cell line. And so um, the, the um, what I wanted to kind of uh, leave you with is this, this next generation RNA-seq uh, workflow is really simple, uh, reproducible, and standard workflow. So this is uh, essentially the workflow that we are we are uh, recommending now for the standard RNA seq. That um, once again, 70 to 80 percent of the users of our systems do standard mRNA seq um, uh, preps and analysis. And so, uh, once again, if you if um, if you have the Neo Prep system. Everybody has access to the base space um, uh, uh, cloud-based analysis these days. Um, and so if you can uh, start with your 16 samples, like I say, load them on day one, sequence them on day two, analyze them on day three, in essentially a three-day workflow, you can go from starting total RNA to uh, a fusion detection. And this is just some of the details of, of what we're doing here. This, like I said, there's 16 samples per run. We had an average of 25 million paired in 2 by 75 base pair reads, which is sort of what we recommend um, and, and is, is, is uh, uh, we sell kits specifically for that for the next seek system. And uh, this is done with a standard top hat analysis in, in base space. And so less than three days from RNA to results. And so with that, I would like to um, thank everybody for attending this. Um, and um, would like to entertain some questions. And so um, I see that some people have uh, have put some questions out to uh, Judy and I. So I'm going to pass the ball back to Judy and see if we can um, Judy, answer some questions. Judy, if we can uh, answer some questions. If we can, uh, if we can, uh... Thank you, Dr. Shrew, for that informative presentation. We do have questions. Before we get started on the question and answer session, though, I'd like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. And our first question is, is there a fragmentation step in the Neil Prep workflow? <clears throat> so that the question of the, the question of the question of the question of the question the question of whether there is a uh, a a fragmentation step in the Neo Prep workflow reminds me to uh, tell everybody that the the Neo Prep version of our RNA seq analysis is exactly the same steps that are used in our in our standard kit. So. Yes, there is a fragmentation step in the NeoPrep workflow, and um, uh, it's it's exactly the tuned to the same way that our TrueSeq kits, our TrueSeq workflow, are tuned. Um, so, for the, any of those, any of you who have used our workflow, we start with total RNA, we fragment it because we have shown over the years that the random priming process is much more uniform and um, much more. Uh, uh, gives much more even coverage after fragmentation. So the answer is yes, there is a fragmentation step in the workflow. Step in the workflow. Step in the workflow. Okay. Is the NeoPrep scalable to prepare, say, 16 targeted panels for the MySeq? So, so, so the, um, that question, um, in terms of scalability of 16 target panels, um, I think the uh, um, is an interesting question. That sounds more like a DNA question, frankly, um, and it does remind me to to tell you that the um, essentially Amplicon sequencing workflow, um, which is sort of what I'm thinking of, is that the answer there is going to be um, um, is going to be a good one. Uh, a good a, a good application. Essentially, what we are doing is um, eventually there will be many of our work our start standard workflows onto NeoPrep 
the uh, TrueSeq custom Amplicon workflow is going to be one of the uh, workflows that we release over the next six to 12 months for the NeoPrep system. Right now we have only the mRNA and the, um, and the DNA Nano. But as I said, that, that sort of covers probably 60 to 70 or 80 percent of most of the things that people do with next generation sequencing are those two kits. What is fusion calling? Ah, okay. Um, fusion calling, uh, that's an interesting uh, question. Um, I would say fusion calling is very specific to uh, cancer, and essentially that's the way you, you use RNA-seq to look for genes that have been fused together by a translocation event that happens at the DNA level, usually in an intronic region, um, such that two genes that are not supposed to be transcribed together get transcribed into one primary transcript that are in spliced into a fusion transcript. So for instance, there's some very famous uh, examples. The, the Philadelphia chromosome creates the BCR able transcript which is one of the positive controls we use in many of our cell lines. And that's a classic cancer fusion. And so that's what I was referring to by fusion transcripts. Will the NeoPrep technology be appropriate for ribome minus sample prep? So that's, a, that's another good question. That's actually, uh, uh, again, one of the other uh, protocols that we will be porting onto the NeoPrep system over the next six to 12 months. So as of today, the uh, system only does the mRNA protocol, not the ribo zero or the total RNA protocol. Um, and so the, um, but I would, I would look for that sometime over the next six to 12 months that we would, um, we would have that, uh, the, essentially what we call total RNA seq using the ribo zero technology, we will have some of those kits available on the NeoPrep system as well. How important is the RNA integrity before library preparation? So, that's another uh, really good question that I, I, I should have talked about a little bit more when I was talking about the differences between the total RNA prep and the mRNA seq prep. So with mRNA, because we are doing a poly A capture, it is really important that the RNA be very high quality, such that when you grab onto the poly A tail, you essentially capture the full length mRNA. If the RNA is degraded and you, um, um, and you, uh, use the poly A prep, then you will um, essentially be capturing just the three prime end of the transcript, which most people are not that interested in. So that's one of the biggest advantages between the total RNA and mRNA. If you do total RNA and you just do ribo zero depletion, then essentially um, we don't have any five prime or three prime bias due to fragmentation so or, or degradation. So the ribo zero technology works really well in cases where the RNA is either of varying qualities, um, say very high quality and you're trying to study it with also low quality samples, or when cases where the, um, the, the RNA is just all poor quality, where the mRNA protocol really doesn't work very well. So the ribo zero approach, um, um, which I said is sort of coming in the future on NeoPrep, right now we saw a wide, a whole suite of kits that do ribo zero uh, approaches. Um, um, I would say the um, uh, that 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 so so it's, as of today we um, we we don't have that available. Is there another question? Yes, um, several. Um, what is the price of the machine and the price of cartridges? So um, the the machine is the, the price of the machine is um, and I'm not going to 
give exact prices at the moment. I don't know the exact prices, but I think the the the, the instrument itself is around fifty thousand um, dollars, and the um, the price of these of the cartridges is going to be um, these are going to be priced at exactly the same price as we um, charge for the kits in the manual version. So, for instance, in the DNA nano i think the price per sample is uh, 30 or 35 dollars in our manual kit it's going to be exactly exactly the same in the neo prep version which in my mind is a is a real a terrific bargain because you're not only are you streamlining the workflow and saving time and money on in terms of prep but also just to remind you that that, that the the system will do this quantification and normalization so you really don't need to do a bioanalyzer trace, you don't need to spend time doing qPCR. Um, you, you really save a lot of time and money on the back end of the analysis of the libraries as well. So, these the, the system for both the DNA and the RNA prep will produce normalized libraries that are all at 10 nanomolar concentrations, and I think that that is um, um, uh, a, a good good way to think about it. Do you need to do a separate analysis in order to identify mutations that might be present in the sample studied? So, um, if you're looking for mutations, and sometimes people do use RNA-seq information uh, for um, mutations, um, and I, I didn't I didn't mention that, but the uh, Top Hat app that we have, I think, has probably the best variant calling um, uh, software that's available in a pipeline like this. Um, it sort of will automatically call all the variants um, in the RNA seq data. Um, as I mentioned, it also calls fusions, which fusions are technically mutations as well. Um, but in terms of like single base changes or coding SNPs, et cetera, things like that, or mutations in a cancer sample, those are actually also called by our Top Hat app. It creates uh, VCF files, and you can export those VCF files and analyze them, even compare them to DNA VCF files. If you know there are there are apps out there that are called VCF compare kind of apps that are both in base space now and also out in the, uh, in many academic labs and other labs. You can you can use the the base the the Top Hat part of our app to um, to analyze um, uh, 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 variants as well, and, and I, I assume that's what you mean by mutations. Um, I think we have time for a, a few more questions. I see there's actually quite a lot of questions related to uh, anal analysis of different species, and so in um, in base space today, we we have uh, the genomes there for human, mouse, rat. Um, and several other uh, uh, species that are available in sort of what we call the iGenomes. The exact species, whether the species that you're interested in is, um, is available for analysis in our BaseSpace app, have to uh, sort of log on to BaseSpace and, and, and check the documentation. I know there's a, quite a wide variety of, of, of species that are um, uh, essentially ready to go for this sort of analysis uh, that I've described here, but um, I I can't also um, um, uh, go through every single different species. So um, the one final question, and then um, I'll pass it back to Judy to wrap it up here. The other, the other question I see is about uh, de novo assembly, and um, you may have noticed that in the Cufflinks app. So if once you run Top Hats with Top Hat, which is sort of alignment. Cufflinks actually go, has a, uh, you can sort of click a box that says ask for de novo assembly and it will, um, it will essentially um, uh, perform a de novo assembly and, and do transcript discovery and report that out also in a separate file. So anybody who's ever used Cufflinks knows uh, uh, the, the sort of output I'm talking about. And that's the other thing to, to sort of highlight about the base base apps. They have a lot of interesting features and a lot of interesting <clears throat> outputs that, <coughs> excuse me, that we have designed um, and reports that we think are useful. But also, it also has uh, essentially all the standard outputs that if you've ever run Top Hat cufflinks before, like many labs have, 
all the uh, typical outputs of BAMs and um, uh, uh, everything else that, that the output that the system normally outputs are available in the base space uh, environment. So um, I think that um, I will thank everybody for their uh, attention and um, if there are any other questions that have come through that we haven't had a chance to, to, to uh, respond to, uh, maybe we can respond to them after uh, words via email. I think actually this, um, this presentation, you can still submit questions if I'm right. Judy will explain that here at the end, but I'd like to thank everybody for their attention and for attending our session and I'll pass the ball back to Judy. Thanks to all who have submitted questions. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through November 13th, 2015. You'll receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event and information will be included about posing further questions. See you next time. Goodbye.